Joel Guy Jr. had spent his entire life being supported by his parents. Everything he had was paid for by them, and he had never held a paying job. When his parents planned to retire and would no longer be able to support their son, he decided to find another way to continue his work-free lifestyle. This is Monsters. Joel Guy Sr. was born and raised in Sergoinesville, Tennessee. He got married to Patricia Tyler on January 3, 1973 in Kingsport, Tennessee, but they divorced on May 20, 1974 in Jackson, Florida. For some reason, the pair remarried on June 6, 1975, again in Kingsport, Tennessee. The couple had three daughters together, twins Michelle and Angela, and another daughter named Chandice. At some point, the couple divorced again, and Joel Sr. went on to marry Lisa Madeer in 1985. Joel Guy Jr. was born on March 13, 1988. After graduating from the Louisiana School for Math, Science, and the Arts in 2006, Joel Jr. spent one semester at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., before enrolling at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge. He had been studying at the university for nearly nine years, supposedly studying to become a plastic surgeon. Though Joel Jr. was an adult and his parents had moved back to Tennessee, he continued being fully supported by them. He never held a paying job and had only spent a short time working in a research internship. His apartment, his vehicle, insurance, and his utilities were all paid for by his parents. Joel Sr. had spent his life working as a pipeline engineer, but when he was laid off in 2016, at the age of 61, he decided it was time to retire. Lisa Guy was working in human resources at an engineering firm, but family members said that the only reason that she worked full-time was to support Joel Jr. They said her whole paycheck went to him. When her husband decided that it was time to retire, they crunched the numbers and Lisa decided that they could afford for her to retire at the same time. They could move to Joel Sr.'s family home in Sergoinesville and spend their retirement together. The only problem? They would have to cut off Joel Jr. This discussion happened with multiple family members prior to the 2016 Thanksgiving holiday. Sometimes, children and step-parents don't have a great relationship, but that was not the case here. One of Joel Sr.'s daughters, Michelle Tyler, testified about that in court. Lisa's been in my life my entire life, and they had said it three, but she's been my entire memory. And so we would go in the summers. Um, my dad would have us for a month in the summer because they li always lived so far away, and Angela and I would go visit for the entire month, but our the dynamics of that was my mom was a single mom, so there's struggles with single moms, but when we went to Lisa's house, her um, cabinets were stocked with food, and she greeted Dad like the perfect Walton family. When they would come home, dinner would be cooked with meat and side dishes, and there would be um, candy in the shelves, and I just would watch her, and I watched her growing up like she was the mom or that dream that you have to have a single, not a single home, excuse me, a double parent home to where she loved. Like, I so wanted to be this woman that my first engagement ring was her exact engagement ring. And I wanted to be the mom she was. I wanted to, she would sit in her little brown, very brown shirt. She had a really high arch in her foot and just with her cup. I wanted to even, at certain points in my life, I walked around with a cup that had like the little square um, placement under it because um, I wanted to be her. I wanted to be the mom that she was. So it's fair to say you all maintained this relationship well into your adulthood. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. At a family gathering at the end of October of 2016, they discussed their plans to retire with Michelle and mentioned that Joel Jr. would have to start supporting himself. Because of your close relationship with them, did they tell you about their plans? Yes, ma'am. We in October and November of 2016, what were you aware about their future plans? We would celebrated my youngest son's birthday in October. It's October 28th, that weekend. 
um, they had said that they um, were retiring and that they were moving to Sigourneville and that um, Joel Michael was going to uh, find a job or need to find a job because they were no longer their money when they sat down and determined even down to the amount of beer that they drink a week and the amount of cigarettes that they have a week um, what amount of money they would need and that amount of money was what they had to retire. Joel Sr. and Lisa had calculated their budget and knew that they could support themselves in retirement but not Joel Jr. At some point before Thanksgiving they told their son about their plans and informed him that it was time for him to support himself. There are no sources for how that conversation happened or what his reaction was. The family had planned to get together for Thanksgiving at Joel Sr. and Lisa's house in Knoxville, Tennessee. They knew that Joel Sr.'s three daughters and their families would be in attendance, but were under the impression that Joel Jr. wouldn't be there. To everyone's surprise, Joel Jr. arrived at his parents' home on November 23rd, the day before Thanksgiving. Not only that, but Michelle said that her half-brother was surprisingly engaged with the family. None of Joel Jr.'s extended family members had a relationship with him. Michelle described that he would normally stay inside his room when they were all together at their parents' house. He didn't talk to them, and she wasn't even sure if he knew the names of her three kids. This time, he was talking to her kids and he had gotten into the boxes of his old toys that Lisa had kept and was giving away toys to Michelle's kids. By Thanksgiving of that year, Joel Sr. and Lisa had sold their home and there was still a realtor sign on the property, as well as a realtor lockbox on the door handle. The day after Thanksgiving, Joel Jr. accompanied his father to Sergoinsville to the home he and Lisa were planning to move into in order to drop off his boat. On the morning of November 26, 2016, while Lisa was out buying groceries and pet supplies, Joel Jr. stabbed his father to death in an upstairs bonus room that was used as a workout room. The two struggled, knocking over a Bowflex machine and damaging some blinds on the window. When Lisa arrived home, she brought in all of the groceries and placed them on the floor of the entryway of the house. Before she put the groceries away, she walked upstairs and was stabbed to death by her son. At this time, Joel Jr. began carrying out his plan to dispose of his parents' bodies and frame his father for the crime. This way, he would collect his mother's full 500000 life insurance policy. When Joel Jr. attacked his parents, he cut up his hands pretty bad, and even though he had tried to take care of the wounds himself, he ultimately decided to drive back to Baton Rouge to get medical treatment for his wounds. It was during this time that people started noticing that Joel Sr. and Lisa were not responding to calls and texts and that something was wrong. Well, Lisa, uh, her work schedule started at 7 a.m., and I noticed at about 7.15 that she was um, not in the office. And um, I normally gave my employees about 15 minutes to get there. And, you know, more out of being concerned that they were okay, I would start calling. So um, 7.15 came, and she wasn't there. Nobody in her group had heard from her. So I began texting her, and she didn't text back. And I thought that was um, highly unusual. Um, a lot of thoughts went through my mind, you know, hoping that she was okay, hoping that, you know, this was her last week. She was retiring, that she had blown us off. Um, but I knew that wasn't right. Um, so I continued to text her. I continued to text Joel Sr. I called um, and never did get an answer. Would and that have been unlike her to sh not show up for work and not oh, to call? Oh, absolutely. If, if she couldn't make it to work, she would have called me immediately. And is, do I understand you to say that you also attempted to call her husband? I did. All right. And how many times would you say you called or texted? I lost track of how many times, but I, I kept doing it thinking this time they're going to answer. Um, I would say at least 20, at least. And then what did you decide to do? I wanted to call the police to have a welfare check done. Um, so I, I called the police. All right. Jennifer Whited was Lisa's supervisor at Jacobs Engineering, and when her employee didn't show up to work that Monday, she tried to call her and Joel Sr. When she got no response from either of them, 
she called the non-emergency police line and asked if they could do a welfare check. Yes, I have an employee that um, has not reported for work today, and highly unlike her. I've tried calling her home number, I've tried calling her cell phone, and can't get a hold of her. What can we do about that? Can somebody go by and check on them? Yeah, do you know her address? I do, I do. It, it is 11434 Golden View Lane. My name is Jennifer Whited, W-H-I-T-E-D. And what company are you with? Jacobs Engineering. And what's the good call back for you guys? It is 865-216. a dog named Jake. I think he's a big baby. Okay. How old is he, do you know? She is in her, I think, late 50s. Do you know if she has any medical issues? No. I mean, she has high blood pressure, but that's all. That's all that I know of. Okay. And I know that their house is for sale, and they are moving, and she is leaving our company, but that's supposed to be Friday, and this definitely isn't like her just not to show up. Okay. Um, I'll send a call over to officers, have them swing by and check on her. Um, and if anything changes before then, just give us a call back here, okay? At the same number? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. It was Lisa's last week before retiring, and other employees had a special lunch planned for her that day to celebrate her retirement. Jennifer knew that she wouldn't have bailed on that. Um, I had realized that nobody had called me, still could not get a hold of um, Lisa or, or Joel, so I called back to see what they had found with the welfare check, and um, I was told that everything seemed to be fine, that nothing looked out of the place, and so... They, they didn't do anything further. I asked them to please go back because I knew that um, something was not right. She had plans with other co-workers today or that day and um, that she would not have canceled or just blown them off. She would have she would have at least called. So I asked them to go back. And what is the next thing you heard in response to your request? Um, I was told that they would talk to a detective to see what they thought and they would get back with me. And what happened next? It was probably 20 to 30 minutes later, I think, um, that I got a phone call from a detective wanting to ask me more questions about Lisa and, and what, I, what I knew. But I did not know that anything in particular had happened. The police sent Sheriff's investigator Jeremy McCord out to the house, who agreed that something was wrong. I had received a uh, phone call um, from our teleserve unit indicating that an employer was uh, concerned for uh, Lisa Guy, who had not shown up for work that morning. Um, she had some type of lunch or some type of event with coworkers planned. Um, her not showing up to work, not answering phone calls or anything else was very uncharacteristic of her. Um, I had also uh, learned that our officers had gone out and done a uh, welfare check at the residence uh, sometime before then. Um, and having that information plus the information that the, the caller is, is still calling in is persistent, that something's wrong, I, I decided to contact the officer that responded and went back to the residence or went out to the residence initially to uh, see what was going on. Okay, and the initial officer that responded, was that uh, Officer Ballard? Yes. Okay. And uh, based on the call, did you go with him uh, back to the residence? I did. And if you would, um, tell the members of the jury what you encountered uh, when you were outside of the residence. 
Uh, upon my arrival, there were vehicles in the driveway. There was um, a for sale sign in the front yard. Um, the back fence was closed. The front door was locked. Um, you could observe, uh, you could see that there were groceries uh, inside the residence. Um, with the vehicles in the driveway and the information that we had, um, it was obvious that the owners of the vehicles uh, could possibly be inside the residence and need assistance. Investigator McCord went with the officer who did the first welfare check to look around more thoroughly. He described what he saw that made him believe there was in fact a problem that needed to be investigated. With the knowledge that she's not answering her phone, she's not responding to texts, and also knowing that the husband had been called as well by the employer, it's alarming. Okay, so we have the cars that were alarming to you, the fact that Miss Lisa Guy is not there at the residence. Uh, Correct. She's supposed to be at work. Uh, what other factors did you consider? Well, the, the front doorknob was uh, it was obviously not matching the deadbolt. Most most doors have doorknobs and deadbolts that that match. Um, and with the lack of the realtor box and the realtor telling me, hey, there should be a realtor box on there. That's just another another factor that we consider in, you know, a circumstance where something has gone wrong and we need to go in and check it out, make sure nobody needs help. Okay, so in addition to the uh, front doorknob, uh, when you go around the rear of the residence, is there other factors that alarm you as an investigator? Well, the back door was missing the uh, the uh, the doorknob as well. The, the back door doorknob, um, it appeared that it was the same color as what was on the front door, if that makes any sense. It's like you took the back doorknob off, you put the front doorknob, put it on the front door, and somehow removed that lock box. Okay, so in addition to the back door missing the knob, uh, was there anything else about the rear of the residence that alarmed you? Was yeah, uh, overall there was there was something emanating from that door to the point where I felt heat and I also smelled an odor that was chemical in nature um, and I'm not certain exactly what specifically that odor was. It was just odd to me. Okay, uh, what about the fact that a doorknob is not present? That, as, I, as I said earlier, that doorknob is removed and it is apparent that that doorknob is on the front door. Okay. And when you went back with Investigator Ballard, uh, did you physically see the groceries uh, inside the front door? You could actually see the groceries from the back door looking through the doorknob as well. So you could tell that there's grocer groceries in what appears to be the front foyer of the residence. Okay. And uh, taking all these factors into account, uh, did you ultimately make a decision to enter the residence? I did to conduct a welfare check. At this point, Investigator McCord makes the decision that there were exigent circumstances that warrant the immediate entry into the home. They called the realtor who confirmed that there should have been a lockbox on the front door and suggested that they check a vehicle for a garage door opener. One of the officers found a vehicle unlocked and that there was a garage door opener inside. They then enter the home through the garage. They continually announce their presence as they clear the house while looking for the residents. As they first enter the home, they pass through the kitchen where you can see a large stockpot on the stove. They make their way to the entryway where you can see a lot of groceries, still in plastic bags, sitting on the floor. As they make their way up the stairs, they see blood on the walls and the floor. You can hear a dog howling in the background which gets louder as they get closer to the laundry room, which is where the dog has been locked. They cleared the rooms until they got to the end of the hallway, where they found a pair of severed male hands lying on the floor of one of the rooms. At that point, they back out of the house and call it in as a crime scene. Once they knew that they had a crime on their hands, the forensics department came in and started securing all of the evidence. Forensic Specialist Officer Sandy Campbell explained that their process is to walk through the scene with a video camera, capturing video of every area of the scene. Then someone comes behind them, taking multiple photos of the evidence without evidence markers. Then they go through and take pictures of the evidence with evidence markers. This ensures that they have no shortage of documentation of how the crime scene was when they arrived. I'm going to describe an edited down version of the walkthrough video here. If you're just listening to the podcast, you can go to our YouTube channel and see the video while I describe it. They enter through the same door that the investigators did. They show a kitchen table that has two wallets, a set of keys, a hammer, a pair of locking pliers, some cash, 
and a purse on it. There are garbage bags and containers of bleach and baking soda on the floor. They then move through the kitchen where you can see a cell phone sitting on the counter to the left and a large stock pot on the stove to the right. The stove top is on and Officer Campbell said that the oven was also on. They get into the dining room where there are weapons and ammunition. There are rifles and shotguns in and out of cases plus containers of ammunition. In the entryway or foyer, they get a shot of the downstairs thermostat which is set to 90 degrees. You can see the groceries that had been brought in but never put away. They go into the living room where you can see that the back door to the house has no handle on it. There are two floor heaters, one is off and one is on. They work their way upstairs where there's blood on the walls in the stairway and at the top of the stairs is a pile of woman's clothing, some scissors, and some containers of chemicals. We see the master bedroom where there's a garbage bag on the floor, some plastic sheeting on the bed, and a pile of random things on the floor. There's a note written on a sticky pad on the dresser. Another space heater is on in this bedroom, and the master bathroom had two large blue tubs that contained body parts and a chemical solution. There was a garden hose attached to the shower head, a knife in the sink, and some rubber gloves on the counter. In the guest bedroom, there was a suitcase, a box of bullets, gloves, and a bottle of chemicals with dried blood on it. There's a backpack by the bed, and on the bed was a large spot of blood and a laptop computer with an external hard drive. The upstairs thermostat had been set to 95 degrees. The upstairs guest bathroom had a pile of men's clothes on the floor. There was blood and bandages all over the bathroom, in the shower, as well as on the counter. There was also a Marine Corps K-Bar knife on the counter. The upstairs workout room had a pile of men's clothing on the floor with two knives next to it. There was a treadmill in the middle of the room with a bow flex tipped over on its side on top of it. In the forward left corner of the room was a massive amount of blood and sitting next to the tipped over Bowflex was a pair of severed male hands. At this point, investigators begin collecting and processing evidence. The medical examiner arrives to observe the remains as they're found before they're transported to the Emmy's office for autopsy. Both Joel Sr. and Lisa had been stabbed to death their clothes were cut off of their bodies, and they had been dismembered. Their body parts were placed into two large plastic bins in the master bathroom, and the bins were filled with a chemical mixture, most likely a combination of water and sewer line cleaner, which contains a large amount of lye. So, again, the autopsy is uh, an examination of the outside of the inside of the body. And the first thing to note with Mr. Guy is um, his remains had been dismembered. The arms had been removed at the shoulders. The legs had been removed at the hips. His head was completely skeletonized and there was some area uh, of defect of the bone of the, the forehead. Um, the, the bone in that area was in such poor um, condition that it was impossible to tell whether that was from the chemicals in which the, the skull had been or whether it was from blunt trauma. Um, there was skin remaining primarily on the back of Mr. Guy, approximately from his lower neck around his buttocks, and the remainder of the skin was gone. The remainder of the skin had been dissolved by chemicals. And with the skin being gone, it basically exposed bare muscle and some of the subcutaneous tissue. So the, the remains were in a, uh, a very complex and, and difficult uh, state um, to, uh, to examine and to describe. Okay. So uh, did you observe any wounds? I did. To his... his uh, body parts and could you yes. describe this so in in documenting the wounds um I, I have to say that i have to give a number of wounds as an at least because there was uh so much um loss of tissue uh so you know even some of the arms uh mr guy's arms were down to bone and some of the bone had begun to dissolve there could have been more wounds 
So the numbers of wounds that I give is at an at least number, meaning so much of the tissue was gone, so much of the skin was gone, that it's impossible for me to give an exact counting. So the wounds that I could see and document primarily were on Mr. Guy's back where the skin still was relatively intact. And on the skin of his back, he had what I identified as 34 sharp force injuries. And sharp force injuries are either stabs or cuts. These sharp force injuries, uh, again, extended from um, up near about the area of his shoulder down to his buttocks. They were on both sides. The wounds ranged from about one inches in length to about seven inches in length. And the maximum depth was about six inches. Associated with these stab wounds, I identified injuries to the liver, lungs, and kidneys, and ribs. Again, there likely was more. Uh, because of the dismemberment process, uh, it was some of the uh, cuts, it was difficult to tell if it was part of the dismemberment process or actually a sharp force injury that occurred while Mr. Guy was still alive. The only body part that wasn't in the bins was Lisa's head, which was inside the large stock pot that was cooking on the stove in the kitchen. So like Mr. Guy, uh, Mrs. Guy was also dismembered. Uh, there was some differences uh, in the uh, degree to which she was dismembered and the way she was dismembered. Her head was uh, completely severed from her body. Um, her arms were disarticulated at the shoulders and her legs were disarticulated at the knees. So in comparison to Mr. Guy, who had his legs disarticulated at the hips, Mrs. Guy's um, legs were at the knee. So her, her thighs were still intact. Her thighs were still attached onto her body, but her head was completely severed and her arms were completely severed. Much like Mr. Guy, the skin of her back was still relatively well preserved um, compared to her front where there was almost no skin left. Um, Mrs. Guy's head was found in a, uh, a large pot in liquid in the kitchen. Um, the, the liquid in the pot um, had a slightly different character to it than the liquid in uh, the plastic tubs. It, it didn't have the strong chemical odor. It had a slight odor of decomposition, but it did not have the chemical odor like the, the bins upstairs did. And the skin that remained, the skin and flesh that remained on her scalp was different. It did not have um, the, um, the, 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 the top layer of skin was still intact. In other words, the skin looked like it had heat artifact or what we call thermal artifact as opposed to a chemical artifact. The hair was still there as well. Um, and so that those, those were the primary differences. Um, Miss Guy had multiple sharp force injuries on her back. She had at least 25. And again, I'm having to do a little bit of a hedge because of the, the, the degree to which the remains were altered. Um, again, the wounds were on both sides of her back. They were approximately six to seven inches deep. They included injuries to the heart, so the right ventricle or the right side of her heart, the aorta in her abdomen, which is the major blood vessel that, that leaves the heart and feeds the, um, the lower portion of the body. Both lungs were injured, the left kidney, the liver, and her third uh, thoracic vertebra, so a bone in the spine also appeared to be injured. She also had five stab wounds that were relatively superficial on her buttock as well. One of the items that was collected by investigators was a maroon-colored backpack that had been sitting on the floor by the bed in the guest bedroom. Inside that backpack was a calculator, an umbrella, a printed paper about how water heaters work, a number of books with Joel Guy Jr. written on the inside, as well as a notebook with a bunch of handwritten notes inside detailing the plan to kill Joel Sr. and Lisa. Officer Rachel Sandlin reads the entries. Get killing knives. Quick. Multiple. Get is carving. Quick, or is that quick? Q-U-I. Is that a C or is it an E? Qu 
quiet. Yes, it could be. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, it appears to be an ET. Yes, um, multiple. Get carving knives to make small pieces. Get sledgehammer, crush bones. Bring blender and food grinder, grind meat. Keep going. Get bleach, denature proteins. Get plastic bin for denaturation process. Keep going. Does not matter where they're killed. Just get rid of bloody spots to prevent evidence of time of death not the mattress or the couches. Get rid of bodies inside house. There and my DNA already there. And then there's a part that's scratched out. Open up doggy door to provide entryway. Can you make out the... Uh, it appears he needs to be... And I can't make out that word. Okay. Um, not intruder. Next line. Um, flush chunks down toilet, not garbage disposal. Get plastic sheeting for disposal process. And then the part that's crossed out, get hollow point bullets just in case. Will be seen buying bullets, just use computer room gun. Check to make sure there are bullets, last resort. He's not alive to claim her half of the insurance, money, and then an arrow, all mine, 500,000. Flood the house, covers, forensic evidence. Turn heater up as high as it goes, speeds decomposition. Bleach reacts with luminol, just like blood, douse area with bleach. Big sprayer. Lie, trash compactor, body gives time of death, and an arrow, alibi. Don't have to get rid of body if there is no forensic evidence on the body. His fingerprints and DNA. He literally lists step by step exactly what he's going to do to murder his parents. He even originally plans to open the doggy door, but changes his mind because he doesn't want the crime to look like it was carried out by an intruder. His plan is to make it look like his father killed his mother and then burned down the house. There were gas cans around the house, and it seemed as though he was going to use the water heater to either try to start a fire or to flood the house. It's not really clear exactly why he had pages about how water heaters worked in his backpack, but it was somehow part of his plan. Officer Sandlin reads the next page. Minimize things I touch throughout visit. Wear gloves and socks to prevent fingerprints and footprints. Drop something down the garbage disposal to break it. Get him on the ground fixing it. Kill him with the knife. Clean up mess from him before she gets home. Kill her with knife. There's a part that's crossed out. Kill dog after. What's and then above that? leave alive. Can't read her. You're able to zoom in there. Okay. And the It appears to be fingerprints. Okay. Uh, and then take dog with you. I can't read the first word. Him with him is in parentheses. Okay. The next line. Place her in shower. And then with dog appears to be crossed out. Turn on hot water and point at her to get rid of forensics. Remove her clothes and take them with me for disposal. Place him in plastic bin and use it to get him into the upstairs bathroom. Cut off his arm and plant his flesh under her fingernails. Place her hand with his DNA so that his DNA is not washed away by the shower. Use sodium hydroxide to destroy his soft tissue and soften bones for transport. Based once every hour to accelerate. Flush sodium hydroxide down the toilet. 
wash out bin with handheld shower head and then direct handheld into toilet to flush everything out of the pipes and into the public waterway. Douse killing rooms, kitchen with bleach. Place hair curler with flammable paper and flammable containers of gasoline in four locations. His killing room, her killing room, his bathroom, her bathroom. Wipe down areas near killing rooms and bathrooms. Turn heaters up to 90 degrees to melt fingerprints and dry everything. Set her phone to send me a text message late Sunday to prove that I was in BR and she was alive, in quotation marks. Leave, and I can't read the word that's marked out, through front door and wipe down doorknobs. Timer for flammables set for Friday at 10 a.m. Sunlight masks fire, but not smoke. Everyone at work, so they can't report it. BR stands for Baton Rouge. It sounds like he was going to try to schedule a text from Lisa's phone to his so that he would receive a text from her while he was back in Baton Rouge to establish an alibi. He originally planned to kill the dog, but changed his mind for some reason. He details his plan to make it look like his father killed his mother. That might be what the note in the master bedroom is about. It read, 401k, $53,000. Bank, $20,000. Insurance, $75,000. Hold my old dead ashes and sprinkle us both after you pass at Buzzard's Roost by Angela. Tell all my children I love them, and as you should know, I do love you truly. I had a blast. Signed, Joel M. Guy. It sounds like a suicide note, but it's dated December 19th, 2013. Officer Sandland reads the next couple of pages of the notebook. Ultraviolet light shows fingerprints. Check mail before leaving. To get rid of blood, use peroxide. And there's an arrow um, stating hemoglobin per pointed at peroxide and bleach. And then an arrow DNA pointing at bleach. Photograph 583. It appears to be titled Destruction of Bodies um, and then Composition of Body 20% fat, 20% protein, 55% water, and 5% other compounds. Not only does the notebook contain very detailed plans to murder Joel Sr. and Lisa, but it also contains a description of the exact motive for the crime. Uh, it appears to be titled Assets, um, Her Assets, Her Life Insurance, 500000 possibly more with double indemnity. With him missing slash dead, I get the whole thing. All her other assets are joint. Go to him if missing, unknown if he is dead. His assets includes all joint property if missing. When he gets all joint property, also gets joint debt. Knoxville House, homeowner's insurance, possibly but probably worthless after fire. O oh, one hundred thousand. The Sir Goinsville House appraised at four hundred thousand plus, worthless with Renee on property. Me. Her car, his SUV, and that seems to be bracketed, not paid for. Um, his boat, his old truck, and that seems to be bracketed with paid for. His four hundred one k. 80,000, possibly less after, zoom in on that word. Can you zoom in? Could it be taxes? It very well could be, yes. Okay. And the next line? He could possibly have savings and or investment accounts. It was clear now that the primary suspect in the case was Joel Guy Jr. 
It's believed that he wanted to remove the realtor box from the front door so nobody was able to come in and stumble upon the crime scene. The problem is that you can't remove the lock box from the door handle unless you're able to open the box. So instead, he removed the entire door handle and then put the handle from the back door onto the front door so as to not raise suspicion from having a front door with a missing handle. He then left to get treatment for the cuts on his hands from the student clinic in Baton Rouge. I believe he didn't want to get treatment locally because that would make it obvious that he was a suspect, so he traveled back to Baton Rouge, so if they questioned his wounds, he could claim it happened at home and try to show he wasn't in Knoxville at the time of his parents' murder. Joel Jr.'s actions before and after he murdered his parents were caught on multiple surveillance cameras. Most of his purchases were made with cash at self-checkout lanes, but he can still be seen on camera purchasing the items. He is seen on camera purchasing a bleach sprayer at a Home Depot. He's caught on surveillance buying a Marine Corps K-Bar knife at Academy Sports. He's also on video purchasing the large blue bins at a Walmart in Knoxville, the same blue bins that his half-sister Michelle saw in his car on Thanksgiving Day. After the murders, he can be seen on surveillance cameras at the Knoxville Walmart purchasing bandages and ointments to treat the wounds to his hands. The Knox County Sheriff's Department, the East Baton Rouge Sheriff's Department, and the FBI all worked together to watch Joel Jr. in the days after the bodies were discovered. He seemed to have no idea that his plan was foiled, and on November 29th, as he left his apartment and went to get into his car, he was arrested. He was clearly planning to return to Knoxville to resume his plan, since when his car was searched, there was a KitchenAid mixer with a meat grinding attachment found in his trunk. Joel Guy Jr. immediately refused to cooperate with authorities. Not only that, but he seemed to have done everything he can to waste time. He refused to waive his right to an extradition hearing, something that is commonly waived because, especially in a case like this, there was no way he was going to not be extradited. Eventually, he was transported back to Knox County, Tennessee, where he pleaded not guilty to two counts of first-degree murder and filed a motion to serve as his own counsel. He stated that he only wanted to represent himself so he could file a motion to receive the death penalty if he's found guilty. So, he pleaded not guilty, but wants the death penalty if he is found guilty. This is all attention-seeking bullshit from a spoiled piece of garbage. Ultimately, Judge Stephen Sword told him that he would let him argue that if he reinstated his lawyers, and Joel Jr. agreed. The prosecutor responded that they had no plans to seek the death penalty, no matter what Joel Jr. wanted. During the entire trial, the defense didn't really have a clear defense. They asked a few questions on cross-examination, but they presented no witnesses or evidence. Sometimes people who have clearly committed a murder plead not guilty because they want to argue that it wasn't premeditated. But that wasn't the case here. Joel Guy Jr.'s defense got up at their closing argument and claimed that Joel Jr. had not committed the crime. That weekend, Joel Guy was outgoing, friendly, and happy. In a way, Michelle Tyler had never seen him before. Outgoing, friendly, and happy. That was not a man about to commit a homicide. Outgoing, friendly, and happy. You saw it in the picture from the, from the front porch. Smiling, happy. That's who Joel Guy was that weekend. He was not someone planning on committing a murder. And remember the facts of the case. His father was stabbed at least 41 times, his mother at least 32 times. That is anger. That is rage. That is not happy and outgoing. We heard family testimony that they planned to cut him off financially at Christmas. This was not Christmas. This was not when that was going to occur. That's why we have to look at every fact to see if this adds up. 
Because just from that very start, outgoing, friendly, and happy does not add up to what happened here. Rage, anger, and death. So because he acted friendly two days before, he couldn't have murdered his parents? Has nobody ever been happy on a Thursday and then angry by Saturday? And since they weren't going to cut him off until Christmas, he couldn't murder them around Thanksgiving? That's a pretty weak argument. The notebook, they tell us, well, they did no DNA on the outside of the notebook. So that means on, on at some point, someone touched the outside of that notebook. What about DNA on the writing on the inside? When you write, your hand's often in contact with the paper. Touch DNA would be all over that. That's the thing that you want to know, isn't it? Is his DNA on the part where there's a writing? We didn't do that. Page at five pages, we could have done that. Hand on the paper when you're writing. They didn't do that. And on the notebook, they also did not bring in a handwriting sample to say, yes, this is his writing. The burden is on them to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt, and they didn't do that. Get the fuck out of here. Let me get this straight. They found a murdered couple that had been stabbed, dismembered, and partially dissolved, and there was a notebook that belonged to the defendant that described killing his parents the exact same way, and you think there's a reasonable doubt? The remains were found in two large blue bins, and the defendant is on camera buying those bins a few days prior, and you think there's a reasonable doubt? The notebook described using a meat grinder, and when the defendant was caught, there was a meat grinder in the trunk of his car, and you think there's a reasonable doubt? They found gloves that had blood on the outside, and the defendant's DNA on the inside, and you think there's a reasonable doubt? Fortunately, the prosecutor was able to point out some of this ridiculousness in her rebuttal. You know, circumstantially, ladies and gentlemen, when you consider that that notebook came from a backpack that was found in the room where his sister uh, testified that he was staying on the Thanksgiving holiday, uh, it makes sense that it's the defendant's notebook and the defendant's writing. I would also point out to you that inside that backpack were uh, several books that uh, you saw in uh, technician uh, Sandlin uh, published to you, and on the inside of those books uh, was the defendant's name, Joel Guy. Um, so the books that were in the backpack uh, belonged to him. The notebook had his DNA on it, and the backpack was found in the room where he was staying. So uh, you don't have to be, uh, you know, just a, 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 an expert in logic to make the connections that the notebook is his. But I would also like for you to consider the writing itself in the notebook, and there are references uh, in those writings, uh, despite the fact that there's no handwriting uh, expert here. Uh, and if we did have one, the defense would be saying that that's junk science and you can't prove it. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are references in the notebook that indicate that uh, the person who is writing this is the defendant. Uh, why else would he say that his DNA would be found inside the house? I mean, logically, uh, why would anybody other than the defendant write something like that in the notebook that has the defendant's DNA on the outside of it, uh, in the notebook that's found in the defendant's backpack, along with other books that belong to the defendant? Uh, throughout this writing, he makes references to things that only he would know about. His mother's insurance policy, the fact that he would be the beneficiary, um, the fact that uh, he had done calculations to uh, examine his parents' assets, his father's assets, his mother's assets, uh, the language all mine, I get the whole thing. I mean, who else other than the defendant would be writing these things in this notebook that has his DNA on it that was found in his backpack along with his books, uh, the backpack being in the room where he stayed the weekend of these murders. So, uh, and that's just with respect to the, uh, the backpack. It was also discovered that Joel Jr. had made large payments to his apartment complex, his utilities, and his school. 
It seemed that he had prepaid his rent and utilities for quite some time. His half-sister Michelle confirmed that at trial. Were you uh, involved in your father's estate in any way after, uh, after their deaths were uh, confirmed? I was the executor of this. I mean, the executor of Dad's estate, not the executor yes. of this. Yes. And as part of your duties as the executor, were you made aware of financial transactions on your father's accounts that took place after November the twenty sixth, two thousand sixteen? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay. And as part of your uh, duties as an, the executor, did the estate receive any sort of credits on uh, the accounts as a result of charges that were made after? November the 26th, 2016. They, it's because it's, if it was before that date, it's not considered theft, so there's no disputing it. But since it was after the date of their death, I pro provided a death certificate. And there were such large amounts of, um, large amounts for utility, a large amount for a school. The only thing that we didn't get back, and it's the, and it was just because his, he paid, or, Someone paid on the credit card the ten thousand. It was a ten thousand dollars amount to his apartment complex, but the apartment complex refused to even. Okay. What school were you dealing with? LSU. LSU. Yes. Joel Guy Jr. didn't even wait to receive insurance before he tried to benefit from the deaths of his parents. He paid his apartment complex $10,000 for prepaid rent so he could continue his work-free lifestyle. On October 2nd, 2020, Joel Guy Jr. was found guilty of two counts of first-degree murder for the murder of Joel Sr. and Lisa. He was found guilty of three counts of felony murder, which is the charge for the death of a person while another felony is being committed. One count was for committing the murder of Lisa while he was already murdering Joel Sr. The other two counts were for the deaths of both Joel Sr. and Lisa while committing theft. He was also found guilty of two counts of abuse of a corpse. Judge Sword sentenced him to two life sentences with the possibility of parole after 51 years, to be served consecutively. So, at any point after 51 years, if he does manage to get parole, he will then start serving his second life term. He was also given another four years for the abuse of a corpse charges. So the soonest Joel Guy Jr. could possibly be released from prison is the year 2122. He'd be 134 years old. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Be safe. Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. Also, remember that if you'd like to support the show, the easiest way is to donate a few bucks at Buy Me A Coffee or check out some of our merchandise at Teespring. You can find information on how to do that along with links to our social media at thisismonsters.com. Thanks again.